elevate your spiritual well-being through psychic surgery? Are you ready to unlock the mysteries of your spiritual self? Do you yearn for a deeper connection with the cosmic energies that surround us? If so, mark your calendars for November 17th as Dale Tobin presents the groundbreaking psychic surgery course for spiritual health and wellness. For those seeking to enhance their spiritual journey, this course offers a remarkable opportunity to delve into the depths of your inner being and discover newfound clarity and healing. With Dale Tobin, a renewed expert in the field of psychic surgery, as your guide, you will embark a transformational journey like no other. It's on mute. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was on mute. <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talking Stick Show. So, this show, we're going to be talking about death and dying and the experience shared through going through this. So, firstly, I'd like to welcome the hosts we have this evening. I'd like to welcome Laura Massey to the show. Hello. Hi Dale, hi David, and hi Amy, who's somewhere out there in the ethers trying to get back in. And hi everybody, and to guys in the chat too. Hello, and we have the incredible David Ellis. Hello, David. Hello, everyone. Um, just having a bit of tech issues, so I fixed it just now. Sorry about that word mess just now. <laughs> we have Mr. AI himself here. How are you, David? How how's things in David's world? Oh, I'm tired. Tired. We have a webinar today, but um, I am going to um, make it the best webinar possible experience for people who are coming out. Beautiful. So let's go into today's show. What um, Amy should be in any minute now. She's like Laura said, got a few internet issues. So deaf oh. and dying. Who wants to start with this? Laura? Hold on one minute. I'm just messaging no, Amy to get her bit. So uh, get her back did in. You, did you ask who wants to start with death? We should finish with it. No? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> honestly speaking, um, there's, a, there's a lot of misconceptions about the death process. One of the things that I find very interesting is that every there's this whole saying, everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? Mm. Every, so in our terms, everybody wants to get to the astral and higher planes, but nobody wants to die to get there. Here's the problem with that concept. If you really believed and knew that higher planes existed, then dying would not be a problem for you. You'd be like, uh, let's hope the truck hits me today. Okay? Right? But a lot of people, you know, there was an old professor that I had. Um, he used to teach me a, a, a brand of metaphysics. And he said to me, uh, the best thing that you could do for yourself is to try to die a little bit every day. Okay? <laughs> and what that means is that instead of this belief, oh, I believe in heaven, I believe in hell, I believe in the astral plane, I believe in all of that stuff, 
it might be a good idea to prove that these things exist to yourself through deep meditation, contemplation, spiritual practice. That way, when death comes, you know this is not the end because the only thing you're afraid of when about dying is that it will be the end. Yes. And that's it. Great start for that, David, because such a good way of looking at it. So when I was younger, I was a bit scared of death. I remember going around about the age of 12, 13. You start to think these things, don't you? You're like, what happens after death? Like, I'm, you actually think about yourself dying and it's quite scary. So let's go into the fear around death and where's this fear created? Honestly, I think it's because people are disconnected from themselves and it, everybody wants to think that they have a soul and a spirit. Nobody wants to put out the work and effort to actually prove it to themselves. So you tell somebody, you got to meditate because meditation will remove the doubt. Mm -hmm. And then they tell you, sure, I'll do it. And they never get around to it. And so when they see someone else die, like a family member and so on, the fear sets in that this is the end. Okay. The fear sets in that this is the end. There is a reason why yogis, gurus, and all those spiritual masters when it is their time to die, they're like, yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> like, whatever, man. Yeah. Done it before, so we'll do it again. Okay? <laughs> All right? There's a reason why they're like that, because they're sure of something that you're not. They're absolutely mm -hmm. certain of something that a lot of people are not. Yeah, so. Yeah, they have a faith. David, what part has religion played in, in creating that fear around death? The okay. heaven and hell thing. So dig this, right? Mm. This is a no-win situation, the heaven and hell thing. But you see, I, I think really simply, right? Really simply. If I win the faith game and I go to heaven, then I get to sit on clouds with a harp and, you know, strum. But if I go to heaven, I go to everlasting hell. And so a lot of people are frightened of that. So if you are a religious person, they put this thing about this eternal lake of fire where you're burning consistently for all eternity. Now, I always ask people, what kind of sick, sick, okay, remove everything that you know about religion. Remove everything that you know about God, the universe, and all that. Let me put this in normal people's terms for y'all. I create a thing. I tell that thing, hi, you have free will. You can do whatever you want. But you better do it exactly as I tell you to do it or else I'll burn you forever in everlasting flame for the rest of your life. <laughs> for all existence, you'll be burning. Yo, that is a mental problem waiting to happen, yeah? That's a... Come on. Like, and people people ingest this as, well, this is totally the reality. That's exactly how it is, right? But for the spiritual people, they believe in the cycle of birth and death. So you come back, you die, you come back, you die. Uh, just one question. If you've been burnt at the stake, um, you're not coming back, okay? So God put in this memory blockage inside there, right? So there's a memory blockage that happens when you come through the birth canal, according to the shamans, okay? Yeah. And yep. you forget. Yeah, knees, yeah. But then you run into assholes like Andrew, who are going to tell you <laughs> what has happened to you before. I know <laughs> you don't want to know that shit, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> because of, oh, shit. You know, maybe he's right. Because then you have all those little, those little, um, what do you call these, um, unexplainable fears and triggers inside your system. And you can't explain them, and it happened to you from a past life. So uh, you run into these these guys like Andrew is going to say, "Oh yeah, you know you were burnt at the stake the last time," and you'll be like, "I didn't need to know that. I'm not coming back." <laughs> 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 and a lot of people say, "I think it all comes down to like I like using the words forgotten and remembered." Um, that a lot of people come into this world and they forget what the true reality is. But when they go into a healing state, like you mentioned, the meditation or setting up a healing practice within themselves, they begin to remember the truth. 
and it's something I use in in the grandmother psychic surgery workshops. The great remembering Andrew talks about it, and something I've seen in ayahuasca journeys um, that we've forgotten. We come in through the birth canal it, with the forgetting, and it's all about us finding the way back to the remembering again. And when you actually touch the infinite source or touch nothingness in meditation, you have have an understanding of what nothingness and infinite is, and we truly are an infinite consciousness. But so many people cannot go into that gear from gear one to gear two. They're just stuck in gear one. And they they completely in this kind of traumatized reality where they actually believe something so uh, absurd and crazy as that you'll go to hell, you'll burn. Like how f- it is crazy when you think about it. Like those words, yeah, like, it is absolutely mm. that shit crazy. <laughs> and the other thing might- is, we've lost so many of the teachings. Sorry, David. Mm-hmm. We've lost so many of the indigenous teachings here, which talk about death and uh, as being part of life, part of the cycle, as we were talking about earlier, that take the fear out of it, that talk about the other worlds, that talk about the other dimensions, talk about the unseen world and make it normal. And it's become, you know, taken away from us, taken away from our society and other things put in its place which don't fill that void for us that we don't understand about death. I was actually just about to make uh, an observation. Did somebody pass around a green dress memo today? You guys need to stop doing this. You have a green shirt, I have a green shirt, Dale has a green shirt, and we have a green background. Oh, I just, yes. I just, yes. What's going on? I get it, the green shirt memo, yeah. Uh, To the people watching this broadcast, this was not done deliberately. (laughs) Is this one of those synchronization moments? (laughs) <laughs> it was like what what did we have on the other week what were we all wearing i can't remember it was oh there was some we were all wearing something I can't, i've forgotten now but <laughs> yeah. okay. well, we are psychics we guys we're supposed to be psychics <laughs> and, and, I, and the thing about it is that i don't wear colored stuff today it was, it was a bad laundry week because you know i'm preparing for stuff it's a bad lottery week, and I'm like, yeah, I'll just try on the green today, and everybody has on green. Okay. But let's you get had no let's... black left. <laughs> nothing black left in your wardrobe. No, nothing, nothing black left in, in the wardrobe. Black That's clothes, correct. Yeah. You know, so I, I think about it. just commented saying he's going to wear the green t shirt for the webinar. So you're going to be all green well, tonight as well. <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. It's actually kind of funny because here's the thing. There's the other side of death where people are just dying to get into the astral plane, really, mm. literally and figuratively. So there are a bunch of crazies in the world that will strap bombs to themselves to die an honorable death. I don't know what an honorable death is. Hmm, let me see. If you're dying for a good cause, that's an honorable death. Uh, but then what is a good cause? You get into the honors mm. week. So they literally destroy themselves to get to a better place, theoretically hoping that the place that they're going to is a better place. But then it's theory, but they have more faith than a lot of people who would not sacrifice themselves. So you have to look at that side of it, right? Because somebody who is willing to strap bombs to their chest and, and, and detonate themselves, that person has more faith than you, right? Is it, is it faith or zealotry? Point well taken. Zealotry is also a very dangerous thing. But then there's, mm. there, there are death cults. Is that a Lucia light in your background? It might be. <laughs> you, are, you, are you just yeah, dose so yourself. Just, you so you dose just. yourself before coming on the show. Seriously. <laughs> <You> <laughs> <don't> <laughs> no, I dose myself afterwards. I do dose myself once a day, though. Yes. It's been, ama- it's been amazing. It has been absolutely amazing. Laura. Yeah, <laughs> it has been amazing. Yes, uh, just as a little, as, just a little aside, I will say I started meditation. I don't know how I can come on a show and say this after I teach <laughs> shamanism and things like that. I started to meditate for the first time ever. <laughs> okay, there are different kinds of spiritual practices. Meditation yes. is one of them. But I think when it comes to connecting you to the um worlds above and beyond meditation is that thing 
And the other yes. thing that I, uh, the other thing that is dangerous to a lot of people is that everybody tries to make things sound mystical. Mm. Things may not be mystical, mm -hmm. right? The astral brain should be as familiar to you as brushing your teeth. Nothing yes. mystical about brushing your teeth. You don't think, oh, this is a very mystical experience. Oh, my God. Let me get back to the molars. You're not thinking those kinds of things. You're just thinking, I'm brushing my teeth. That should be a regular occurrence. So the thing about it is that people like to make things sound so mystical. It's in the music. It's in the, it's all in the, the hype and stuff like that. Okay? The interaction between people on just a basic plane. When you say the word namaste to someone, the soul in me bends to the soul in you. Okay? Bows to the soul in you. Okay? It's a, it's a messed up thing because people don't look at each other as souls. So death is a big thing to them. They look at each other as flesh bags. <laughs> right? So when they run into each other, in interaction and so on, especially in a man-woman relationship. Oh, that's a really nice flesh bag you have walking around. <laughs> it's so gross, right? That's a really nice flesh bag you have walking around, right? And the interaction come from the surface level. So most like even just like romantic relationships. Hi, I would like to use your flesh bag for a while. Oh, that came out so bad. But this is the interactions that we have. And so just from a normal human perspective we don't interact as souls right we don't try to interact with each other as souls and that's why death is such a horrible experience because it's the end of the flesh bag okay yeah yeah and also we don't try and interact with um necessarily our, our ancestors or those who've passed like in our lineage members of our family grandparents and so on um, people can be quite put out if you say, you know, well, I, I talk to my parents because they've passed. I I talk to my grandparents. I talk to the grandmothers around the fire. Um, it's almost more acceptable to, to talk to them if they're, they're like far more distant, like say the grandmothers, um, than it is to, to talk to your own parents who've passed in the last couple of years. And yet there's no difference. It's just, it's the same same space isn't it just different place yeah you know i keep saying this people generally don't they feel alone in the world can you imagine the person who wants to commit suicide that person is alone you mm -hmm. want to know why that person is alone that person has not understood that you're not alone you have a whole bunch of people around you right weeping as you stand at the edge of that bridge telling you stop you have value get off the bridge okay and then there's the respect part as well there's a lot of people that are lost in this world they're lost they do not know who they are um today i might be david tomorrow i might be something else or whatever the case may be they have no respect for their ancestors or where they came from they have no grounding and because you have no grounding, you will do anything, right? It's like you take a plant or a vine. It's like the vine, okay? It will try to crawl any which way to get to sunlight, right? Once you get, uh, once you cut it off from source, okay? And so a lot of people look at this construct of the self, the internal self, the, the soul, or whatever else. They look at the death cycle the birth and death the cycle of birth and death as i'm just alone I, I was born alone i'm going to die alone if that is the case there is no point in your existence i am being very clear with you guys right now for those of you in the chat how many of y'all I, I did this on another podcast some time ago how many of y'all know what your name means do you know what your name means? Or do you name your children some arbitrary name coming from some television reality star <laughs> that you saw on television? Do you understand how important that is? All of these things are linked to the soul because it tells your descendant or your it tells your descendant that I know you. I I name you. I name you for a reason. Okay? 
So if you're naming your children Brad Pitt or any of those things, it's ugh, ugh, cringy, right? Because the thing about it is that when that person, when you are ready to transition and become the ancestor yourself, because you left, you lived your life in a surface manner, you didn't love as fully as you could. You didn't. You didn't develop yourself as fully as you could. You have a bunch of DNA walking around the planet doing nothing, dormant as shit, okay? You didn't try to actualize your potential. You didn't try to actualize your DNA because you did not do that stuff. Your death is going to be hard because you, you're dying a surface death. You're dying a flashback death, which is why it is important to meditate, connect, connect. That was, I think that was the hardest part of when my father passed away, um, just knowing that he felt so alone and he couldn't um he couldn't speak to anybody he didn't die he didn't speak to anyone at all before he died he didn't cry in front of any anyone um and that's the hardest thing isn't it seeing someone who's so alone that the spirit's there within them but they choose to fully deny it this life until literally the last point when they do die and cross over to the blue road that they actually understand what life's about and it's interesting that isn't it that just some people are just completely asleep and will never ever, even till the day they die, until that moment happens, they will be constantly, no, I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone all the time. And that's probably the hardest thing dealing with family like that, where you see they're so alone, they're depressed, they're all, that no one can help them and they're just in their own self all the time. Um, it's one of the hardest things to deal with uh, as fa with family members that. But they don't make the effort, though. They don't make the effort. Let's yes. say that your let's say that your present day family are all shits, all of them. Okay, they don't support you. They don't approve of you. They don't. Uh, they're just they're just useless to you. Useless as tits on a turtle. Okay, let's say that's your present family. Your ancestors were of more use. Okay, the ones that have passed over. Why do you not reach out to them and ask them for strength? Let, I want to bring back a few traditions. On my wrist right now is something called an origin bracelet. You might have seen some of them. This is a tradition that, uh, uh, that I want to bring back. Your kids, put a bracelet around them to let them know that you claim them, that this is yours. You want to know what an origin bracelet does? When that person goes out into the world, that person is never alone, no matter where they are. They just need to look down at their wrist. They just need to look down at their wrist and know that somebody somewhere on this planet cares about them. Knows there are versions of that. There are versions of that, aren't there? Because you can buy necklaces or bracelets that say to my son or my they daughter. With... Laura. I don't know why they stop the, uh, stop doing those mm -hmm. things. This mm -hmm. is my son. This is my daughter. This is this is part of who we are as a collective, as a family collective. We mm -hmm. were talking about death. Because you see, death, one of the things that death brings into perspective real quick, it, it throws off the masks, right? So any kind of pretense that you have, let's say you have had your um, breast filled and your butt filled, and I don't know, you're a man and you had like the synthol put in, you have the muscles and so on. When it is that you are walking in this life and you are looking at yourself, as a full human being walking with in this life until the day that you are ready to lie down and close your eyes okay if you have the sense that your ancestors are looking at you you will you will be a lot less amenable to doing stupid shit with yourself okay because when you die you want to say hmm i did something I tried my best, okay? You don't want on your gravestone for them to say, some guy died here, but we don't really know who that person is, okay? And that's another thing. I remember uh, uh, the, the first lines of the, uh, the um, Iliad, I believe it was. It goes, men are haunted by the vastness of eternity. Dot, dot, dot. How will you be remembered? That's the thing that's a that's, major for most people. 
that that's something I regularly do in my own spiritual practice is have regular life reviews. So I always say to myself, if I crossed over tomorrow, would I be happy? What would I want to do going forward? What would my legacy be? Um, and so on. Those are some questions I'd ask myself. And all the time it comes down to ancestral responsibility and what I'd want to do to to make sure I'm as responsible as I can in this lifetime. I've, I'm not polluting my environment as much as I used to. Uh, I'm cleaning up who I am as a person. Those things are very important because if you think when you do cross over and you go through the life review and all the grandmothers and ancestors are there, you 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 could have thought, oh, I could have done better that <laughs> I could have done a bit better, could have put in a yeah. tiny bit more effort. Even 15 minutes a day, as Andrew says, 15 yes. minutes a day of inner yeah. work over the long period of your life. Can Just you, imagine that's what that's going to do to the life review, to the future yes. use. Can you yeah, imagine? Absolutely. Can you yeah. imagine running into great 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 grandfather Tobin? <laughs> <laughs> And this man asking you, see, so Neil, what did you add to us? What did you add to the whole family egregore, the family body of knowledge? And you're like, well, I, I kind of just, just watch football, you know? I, I can tell you some football stats, uh, you know? There she is. Hi, Amy. And you didn't leave a legacy, David. And Amy, Hi. I didn't leave a legacy, David. I left a fallacy. <laughs> that is um that is a hi darling that is a really hi, good yeah. practice though to um what you're saying dale because i do something similar it's like oh how's this going to look in my life review <laughs> i better you know what can i do now to to put that right what do i need to do <laughs> so <laughs> it's not something that's held over me but it is something that you do sort of you, you think about and as you say you have that responsibility it is part of the in, inner work isn't it yes correct can you how are you doing amy Hey, good. Finally, finally. Yes. <laughs> Are you oh on your God. phone? Did your connection yeah. die? The irony. I don't know what happened. I have no <laughs> idea what happened, guys. No idea. You, you saw right. me. I was like... Amy, yeah, can I make yeah. a suggestion? <laughs> Try turning the phone to the side. Let's see it. What's going on? No, Yay. I can't. There you go. No. Oh, it's no, you, you. okay. Okay. Why? What's happening? Oh, what's happening? What do you see? Uh, well, it's we're, we're, I'm plugged in. I'm, I'm, I'm plugged in. Your life so... review, Amy. You need to see that camera. <laughs> <laughs> what do I need to do? Wait, what do I need to do? <laughs> <laughs> I think are you, are, you in? In? <laughs> are you plugged in? <laughs> Are you Tell plugged into I... the source, Amy? Yes, <laughs> I am plugged into the source. <laughs> okay, so your phone is plugged in, yes? Yeah, that's why I can't turn it. I can't turn it sideways. Well, because because it's, uh, yeah, okay. The reason why I ask you to turn your phone to the side is because then you get landscape mode. But that's okay. You're good, uh, you, you're good as you are. The, yeah, we can thing? see you. We can okay. see you. The okay. only thing missing is the green shirts because, you know. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> I wore black because of you know <laughs> death. We're now, why about. why is it black for death? Black Friday, yeah. death. Yeah, black Friday. No, but why why is it? Where's that from? Yeah, why is it black? Because Does anybody um, know? people because people use it as a color of mourning. Because mm. the thing is that death used to be associated with closing your eyes and when you close your eyes you see blackness mm -hmm. and then they bury you in, in, in the ground and then whatever else and then you die right um mm -hmm. but apparently jesus didn't get the memo in in religion and he kept coming <laughs> back right and let's talk about the concept of resurrection so is a coma a little death by the way the little death in literature what is it Let's not even go there. That's a little bit off topic, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a little bit off the topic, but um, th th that's why they, they ooh, no. Ooh, I look really. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, that's why they're associated with black, right? But, and then every uh, they call everything that is um, negative or could lead to death, like the black plague, 
-hmm. like Black Friday, apparently everybody's shopping. Mm -hmm. That's the death of their bank accounts. Um, (laughs) (laughs) All right. But honestly speaking, I don't see um, the biggest problem people have with death is fading away into non-existence. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they haven't got a belief about what happens afterwards. That it's a transition. Mm -hmm. The spirit is in transition. If you guys are really concerned about death, what you can do is go to your local pharmacy. No, I'm not going to finish that thought. Right. But basically, if you really, really wanted to prove the point, right, you could give yourself a little death and then you understand that there's more than just that because these experiments have been done. People have been reduced down to a state of mind called plenary, which is the death of the physical body. And they have been through these experience. Okay. Mm-hmm. They have been through these experience. And w- what it looks like is that the body shuts down because it is so relaxed, it shuts down. And then it goes through the normal processes, what we call the death processes. Okay. And they prove to themselves, oh, crap. Right. De- but the fear of death is actually necessary. And I'll tell you why that is. Because if you told everybody and you proved to everybody in one fell swoop, I mean, on the planet, oh, there's life after death, you know how many suicides you're going to have out there, right? Can you imagine people are like, oh, there's more than this? I'm a way out. <laughs> today, right? right? You have a bunch of people running up and killing themselves. That is why the fear of death might be necessary because it keeps them here. Like, let's say you have house deaths. Your, I don't know, you're going to come home and your spouse or whatever is going to give you crap. Your children hate you, whatever else. And you know that there's there's something more than this. You're going to off yourself, yeah? A lot of people are going to do that. A lot of people are going to do that. But the fear of non-existence keeps them in check. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't. And then going into it as well, like talking about suicide, the types of suicide. So there is obviously the, the individual who actually just wants to cross over, doesn't want to be here anymore. But then there's the individual who's haunted as hell, um, has lots of entities and demons attached to them, whispering. And I've dealt with this a few times in my sessions, mm-hmm. literally whispering in their ear, kill yourself, kill yourself. And a lot of people over a period of time of hearing that entity whispering in their ear all the time they just then eventually do it and that's uh, the crossover there's like so many different types of death and this is why spiritual hygiene is so important uh, looking after yourself looking after your energy um, is vital because the last thing you want is to get a demon as andrew calls them suicide demons to come and sit by the side of you and the person has no awareness that that the demon they think it's themselves and they go psycho it's insane um, and that's another, just another example I, I felt like I had to share from experience of dealing with clients with that. It's really not nice at all. No. no. So I, I have to tell you about this death experiment that was conducted by some, by, it was an unethical experiment, but it was an experiment nonetheless. A bunch, this doctor, insane as he was, you, you guys can check this up on the net. He did... Um, he wanted to see, prove the existence of a soul, right? He wanted to prove that the soul had mass. So you know what he did? He got people that were about to die and he weighed them on a very mm-hmm. sensitive scale until they had passed. Mm-hmm. You see Just the come difference? in, position yourself. <laughs> position yourself. <laughs> you can, you guys go research it on the internet now. Go Google that stuff. Yeah, I did. Is yeah. it 10 oh, grams? Did? Is it 10 grams? Does he say yes. 10 grams or 11 grams? Yeah. And he, he, yeah. He, he, he put it down to um, the soul weighs about 10 grams. Okay. Uh-huh. Because that's the, the, the difference in weight from the human body, which is inhabited by a soul. And when it finally dies. Now, that might be speculative science or it may not be. But if he repeated the study and he found that it is consistent around that, that, that thing, then it proves one thing that the soul has mass. So let's talk about the difference between the soul and the spirit, because a lot of people uses use yeah. those words interchangeably. Yeah. yeah. 
and they use those words interchangeably, is the soul the spirit? And if it isn't, what is the difference? Because in, in French, in the language French, there's a difference. These are two distinct words, right? Yes. What are your thoughts on it before I continue? Well, that I I actually had an experience, David, talking about this, um, which I believe my grandma was there to teach me this experience. Um, I've I've had dream visitations from her as well, and when she she was the first person I saw who died, I remember mm -hmm. go, being in the waiting room, and they said we're going to take her off the life support now, so she'll basically pass any minute. And I remember them coming in and saying she's crossed, her, she's passed away, um, and I went to see her. And from the person I saw, like, breathing and still alive to the person who has died, I realized she wet, she's not there anymore. And I looked at her and innately knew that whatever was there behind was just left behind her, her vehicle. And I, there was no essence at all. The body, you can just tell straight away there's no soul essence there, life force. It's just like you say, David, a meat, a meat suit or, a, a, a you know what I mean, like a bag you wear so that for me was a huge teacher for me because i saw the cha the difference between spirit and the body yeah amy you, you remember we having this discussion right i do remember i do um but i don't remember yet right now but can i just give my like okay body mind or body soul and spirit um so i i, I look at the soul as in the middle and it looks as if it could be the teachings of our life here. What does the soul want to experience here? Mm -hmm. And the spirit is the wisdom that we achieve, that we take with us when we die. Okay, so okay. in Western, yeah, I get it. Okay. In, Western, in Western esoterics, the soul is called a plastic envelope. That's what it's called. It is the yeah. intermediary, intermediary body between the physical, the corporeal body mm -hmm. and what we call the divine spark, which is really theoretically the spirit. But in certain traditions, they put the soul and the spirit is different. So the intermediary body is the, called a plastic envelope. And the reason why they call it a plastic envelope, because it looks like a plastic envelope. Okay. <laughs> it looks like it looks like a plastic envelope. It looks like it. And for those of you who are wondering, David, what the hell are you talking about? I have an exercise for you because, you know, I always have an exercise for you guys. <laughs> the exercise is quite simple and it can be done with somebody who is wearing black, which is why ah. it is off of the camera. So this is oh, basically yes. what the exercise is. No, it's okay. It, it, it's okay. okay. If you get your partner or friend to wear black, and you stare at the center of the body and use your peripheral vision to see the plastic envelope that is around them. You can see it easily, okay? Mm. It really is. So if somebody's wearing black, as an example, and you're looking in the center of the body, the peripheral vision shows the plastic envelope easily, okay? You don't need to be clairvoyant to see that. You just need to practice you just need to practice, okay? Mm. And you don't need to be, like, have years and years of experience. If the person is wearing black, you can see it easily, okay? All right? Um, like that's a simple exercise, okay? You're not going to see all the colors and the auras and whatever else, but you can see the plastic envelope easily, okay? What you call a biofield is the resonance of what's happening inside the plastic envelope, okay? But thank you for, for that. I don't know who just wrote that in there, right? That biofield is the resonance of the plastic envelope, what we call a plastic envelope. That plastic envelope has a kind of anatomy of its own, okay? Because we're talking about where it connects between the where it connects in terms of, of of the corporeal body is what y'all you guys like to call chakras but it's really your endocrine system the chakra system was overlaid on the endocrine system okay is the body is the body's information centers and so like the pineal gland is the obviously the the obvious one where you have a pineal gland and you call it the third eye okay and the thousand wives of solomon which is the top of your head and the thyroid, um, thymus, hypothalamus, gonads, spleen, 
and all those things. You guys get the general idea? So that is the overlay system. The divine spark or the spirit is something that is not accessible. It lays inside the plastic envelope, which is the intermediary body between the two. So this is what they're saying in Western esoterics, which tends to pan out when it is that you're talking about astral projection as an example. What is astral projection? Is the externalization of that plastic envelope, which is tied to the corporeal body, which is no longer tied when the person is dead. Okay? So let's assume for a moment, and I want you guys to go check out an experiment that was done, I believe it was in Berkeley years ago, one of these universities that had the paranormal research facilities. This thing was attacking this lady, okay? And when I say attacking, I mean rape, okay? Oh, I've and seen these videos. Yes, they, they actually made a movie out of it, okay? This thing was attacking this lady. And so because, you know, some researchers had a budget, they figured the best thing to do would be to just um, freeze it and encase it in liquid nitrogen. Mm. Yeah, that, was, that didn't go so well. <laughs> 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 because obviously if it's attacking her and you could see the indentations and the bruise marks and stuff like that on her body right and she's not stigmata stigmata is for those of you who don't know when you have intense faith and you manifest the, the bruises from christ she's not stigmata so how can we determine obviously whatever's attacking her has mass okay meaning that it's tangible if it's tangible then it could be frozen that was the theory okay well they did they did try to do that that didn't end so well for them or anything else anyway the ladies continued to be attacked by the thing after way after the fact but the it, it does the thing about it and i wonder how this world is you know that these things exist there's documented research but you never can find it on the internet but I'm telling you, go look for it. You'll find it. Okay. Are you talking, David? Are you talking about the loads of videos like on TikTok of people getting astrally raped in the sleep? No, you see no, there, no, no. There was an experiment in Berkeley that was done specifically uh, for those things. Okay. For yeah, this yeah. thing, this particular case, and it was documented, and it didn't end well. It didn't. Okay. <laughs> They made they made they made a, a movie. Or it, they just ended up pissing this thing off a little bit more. But the point of the matter is that there is a world beyond this world, whether you believe it or not. And if you really were sincere in your belief, or you were sincere in your faith, you would hunt down the astral world with a fine tooth comb. You would do whatever it took to get up there to free yourself from the anxiety associated with death. So the, it would be great. So in about 15 minutes, guys, we're going to open up to callers to come in and ask some questions. Um, sure. I think for the, the last part of talking about death, so what, what do you think during towards the end of life, what does it do and what does death teach us from experience and say someone crossing over who's close to you? What are some of the teachings that come out of that? Laura, do you want to start? Um. Well, in, yeah, from my own experience, um, being with somebody when they've crossed over is a very privileged um, thing to be able to do. And it's a, a very responsible thing as well. And um, I think they call them soul midwives. I've not been trained in that. I only know how how I can naturally do it. And that is to um, to be very present and to make the space as sacred as possible and as beautiful as possible. Because I think many uh, um, people do need, people who are dying do need assistance off to the other side. Um, I think it's to die alone must be very, very um, 
difficult because I think souls can get lost on the other side if they if they mm-hmm. do die alone. So I think to have somebody there holding that sacred space for them in a very peaceful manner and not rushing anything, not rushing to make phone calls, not not rushing to get an ambulance in. If if this is the time for them to go, then I think that is the duty of the person uh, with the dying person to make that as a peaceful and as beautiful um, crossing over as possible and um, yeah that's what I've I've tried to do I'm not very experienced in it but um, it's a it's a, a very valid role I think and everybody in that um, arena I remember talking to David about this once and he be- he used a beautiful word he said it cre- death creates a vortex and everyone around that dying person does get pulled in in one way or another. So which is where, going back to what you're saying about spiritual hygiene and, and things like that, like carers in homes. In fact, that was the um, scenario that David and I were talking about when he used that um, description, was because if there's people surrounding this person who's dying, they will you can sort of feel or see the the vortex that it creates and everyone does get affected and it's important for everybody involved to try and hold that space and also to look after themselves afterwards um, because it's quite a it's a very moving experience isn't it's a very sacred experience yeah outstanding Laura great words and I'm going to get Amy and and David to come in on this well, I agree with Laura on all that. I've experienced it once with my mother-in-law and I actually, it was very calming to me. And I, death is not a fun thing for me. It's not fun. <laughs> it's kind of a, I'm getting better with it, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's a difficult thing. And it could be from my childhood that I, what I experienced there. So what I'm going to say is my first experience to be with somebody was with my mother-in-law and it was just me and my husband in the room, nobody else. And it is funny how people, when they leave the room, the person dies and only those people are, that are in that room are the ones that were supposed to be there. But I do remember uh, seeing her last breath and holding her hand and, and it was just very calm and I could hear the death rattle. I don't know if you've talked about that, but the death rattle that happens where the breath, you know, the last breath. And I don't know, it just was, it was actually not bad for me. It was kind of um, good for me to be able to to be there and see it. Beautiful, Amy. David. Honestly, Honestly, the thing about death that a lot of people try to avoid is missing that that flesh bag, right? And so the people who are around that flesh bag, they experience sadness in the moment that that person goes away. And I remember one of the things that I said when I was younger and um, I was a kid at the time, and I'm like, you do realize that um, granny is a lot better off than the rest of us, right? I said that because that person who was dying is like, see you later, suckers. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> no taxes, no bills to pay. I don't have to feed anything. <laughs> I don't have to feed anything. Um, let me see what else. I don't have to feed anything. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't. If I, I don't have to comb my hair. Even no hairdresser appointments. No infrared appointments, Amy. Right? Amy. <laughs> I don't have any maintenance after this. I am good. Let me go. I know a lot of people who have died and come back. Okay? Mm-hmm. I have spoken to them. They usually are very pissed. Pissed when they decide that they're crossing over and then somebody, some intrusive person, uses a defibrillator and brings you back. And I'm like, I was good. I was good. I was out. What are you doing? They experienced a lot of, I was good. I was so good. Don't bring me back. Stop. Stop what you're doing. David, that, um, that exactly what you talked about there happened with Jamie Sams. Did you hear about that? Uh, no. So Jamie Sams, the lady who does, my personally, my favorite 
uh, books. Um, she does like the medicine yeah. cards and teachings Can't and so on. The um, yeah, she the um, so she uh, di- she died and she actually had a she had writing where she said, "If I die, do not bring me back." And that she died, they brought her back, and she ended up living like another few months. And she ended up going to court to sue them because they brought her back. So let's talk about that for a moment. Can you imagine you're on an operating table, right? You have no family left or whatever else, right? You have grown to a ripe old age. You're in your 80s, okay? You've probably ingested something wrong and you've died on the operating table, right? Mm -hmm. Some idiot doctor is going to put a defibrillator on your chest, bring you back and then tell you, here's my bill, sir. I was good. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Are you actually going to bill me for this? No, I'm not really <laughs> What the hell are you going to have to kill me, put me in jail or something? What the hell? Right? You've lived, like, my grandmother lived over a hundred years old, okay? Right? She lived over a hundred years old. She was a woman of faith, right? She was very, she was a very devout Christian and sort of real Christian, not, you know, a fake Christian. And she wasn't afraid of death. And she made it very clear to us that she wasn't afraid of death. So when she began to decline in a, in a later years, and we and medical assistance was being rendered to her, she's like, "Why? What are you doing? Why are you wasting my time? Right? I'm done. I'm out of here. Okay, I've seen enough. Okay, because I know a lot of people are afraid of death. But let me tell you guys something. Okay, when you get to 80, 90, and all your friends are dead. Everybody mm-hmm. that you know has gone, passed away, right? And you are the last man standing in a world that you cannot recognize because you're thinking iPhones are complicated. In the next 20 years, iPhones are going to be the easiest thing in the world. And you have not mastered the iPhone. And so you're not going to master whatever new technology that's there to fit in. <laughs> You're, all your friends are dead. All of them are dead. You are the only one left here. You are extremely alone in that in that sense. So I just want to say to you guys, you may not like the, the concept of death right now. Give it a few years. It'll grow on you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to want out of the system. My grandmother looked at, uh, 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 looked at her sons, uh, my uncles, and said, why are you wasting my time? I am done. <laughs> I'm out of there. <laughs> All right. Something in our contract kept her going, though, didn't it? Yes, it was it a grand It was us. It was us. <laughs> Guys, before um, somebody asked me before the show if we were talking about this, she can't listen till later. Um, and she asked what we thought about assisted dying, euthanasia. Hmm. I am. Yeah. I have, to, I have mixed feelings about that. I think if it is done properly with a death doula on hand and the person is in complete agony and it's not going to get any better, there are allowances for that. I think if your favorite reality show was not renewed for another season and you've decided that there is no point in living, then probably not. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right, go to some counseling. There are a whole bunch of people taking advantage of Canada's medical assisted um, suicide, right? There's a legislation in Canada that allows you to kill yourself. And the legislation was broadened for people with chronic mental illness illnesses. And I'm like, no, I don't agree with that for the very simple reason. Do the work, do the counseling. Everybody has value. If you don't want to put in the work to get that person on track and so on. I have, listen, I have been uh, a counselor, okay? There is nothing more gratifying than when you see people make that 180. You guys know what I'm talking about. When that person makes that 180 and they realize, oh shit, I'm actually valuable. What the hell was I doing with myself, okay? When you decide (laughs) that you're going to make that 180 and stuff and they realize I'm now about to live, okay? It's a different thing. So 
medical well, assistance it, it, in line. I, I, I don't agree with it if it's like mental issues that you want to kill yourself and you leave, you leave yourself, right? People have value and people have to be able to, but there are some people that are truly alone. So they want to, to die and there must be services that are allowed to that. And I don't want to get into the, the, the spiral, but every government on earth should have some sort of program where people can reach out to somebody and somebody be there at the other end, a real person, not an AI. I just said that. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he said it, <laughs> he said it here, here. Mark the time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll get there question. eventually. <laughs> A question, um, what about, this is something what um, I've learned about recently, well, I've known it for a long time. Do you know Hunter's disease, David? What? Have you heard of Hunter's disease before? Yes. Yes. Uh, what would you think about that by someone able to get out of that? Once again, there's suffering involved there, right, Dale? Yeah. yeah. Um, cognition... Uh, cognition aside, there's suffering involved there. And I think if you have a death doula on hand, depending on that person's level of cognition in the later stage of Hunter's disease, then it can be a very beautiful experience. Death can be a beautiful experience if it is that you are assuring that person out. It's like showing somebody out of a movie theater. Okay? You can look at it like that. But human suffering is a hell of a thing because there are not that's an expensive illness by the way in case you didn't know it's expensive well i've got a um it's quite a sad, it's a sad story i've got a friend who i used to go out with his dad basically killed himself um when it started to get bad he jumped in front of a train and this guy he's got a few siblings uh, he was he's got it and so he, out of all of this, this the children he had three kids I think the disease has got like a, it gets one out of three or something can go down and he actually has got it. So he's at that point now where he's starting to change. Um, and it, it's, it's nasty. Like it's, it's so sad seeing that. Like that's some, that's the first time I've ever de dealt with it or seen it face to face um, with someone I know. And I used to be, I'm good friends with him. When somebody is terminally ill um, like that, and there is a surety about what they're going to experience. A lot of the times they kill themselves not because they're afraid of what they're going through. They kill themselves so as not to be a burden to their family members. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Nobody Is wants... That, yeah, go ahead. That's interesting you say that, David, because that's one of the things he said to me. Uh, my mum doesn't care anymore. She just watches me fall over. I feel like I am a burden and... That's exactly right. I've I've seen that firsthand. Yeah, they they they, they don't want to be a burden to somebody else. And here's the thing: like I had a friend, um, what about four weeks ago, who utilized, um, who's um, uh, one of their family members utilized um, Canada's medical assistance in dying. They've made that way too cheap. Okay, that's way too cheap for people. So they're gonna uh, people are going to abuse it right people are going to abuse it there are people out there i remember when michael jackson died you know a whole bunch of people committed suicide you heard about that shit oh god Ugh. you you heard about that right you heard yeah, i've not been here about it now michael, time jackson, about michael it. jackson died and people committed not one not two right about three or four people committed suicide because they couldn't live in a world without michael jackson in it oh, oh my god <laughs> that's not the problem there <laughs> there's something else going on <laughs> you see and so, and so like uh, they've made this thing way too cheap for people yes there's a process that they have to go through um, but I think in cases where like Hunter's disease Parkinson's to a certain extent some kinds of cancer as well okay um, they can be extremely expensive in the long haul I mean, extremely expensive, and the person's family suffer because of the uh, because of it. And people are looking at their families um, go down the drain in terms financially and so on. And so they want 
to get out of this whole thing. Okay, they want to get out. And I think that a lot of people choose not to, a lot of people choose not to continue the pain to their relatives. Yeah. And it, it is a sad thing. I mean, like, what would you do in, in that situation? You, you know, the, that is a hard thing to, to do, especially if you're in pain, you want out of that. And then yeah, there's the yeah. metaphysical implication. Is it right? Are you going to repeat this lesson? Is the lesson for you to learn pain? But who's to tell? You don't know, right? Right. Or is the lesson that you have to learn surrender to the ultimate, which is Ishwara Pranadana. For those of you who don't know what that is, it means surrendering to the ultimate. Okay? Surrender. A lot of people don't like that word. The word surrender. I'm going to, I'm going to repeat that so that y'all it, it, it pricks a part of your brain. Surrender. A lot of people don't know what that word means because it has a bad connotation when it comes to war. That's if you think that you're in a war, then the concept of surrender is the problem. For those of us who are meditators in this chat, that would include the new meditator in the chat, right? You need to surrender in order to experience the, the worlds that you're trying to reach. You cannot try to climb up the ladder into the astral realm. For those of you who are meditators, once again, you cannot force meditation. You have to learn the concept of surrender. Surrender is a very beautiful thing. It's going to be one of the best things that you could do, learn when it is that you have to pass yourself. Don't fight. Surrender. Yeah, another word for that almost could be trust, David. Yes. There is... There is There's trust in there. Yeah. So... so Let's open up for callers now, guys. What with some great uh, discussion so far. So what we're going to do, we're going to put the link for the restream into the chat. So if you want to come on the show and ask any of us a question, or if you want to share your own experiences about death itself and around that, uh, here's your time to do it. And we see there's a lot of questions actually in the chat. So come on and ask those questions instead of putting them on in chat. We invite you to come on the show. Uh, so the link's in the chat for you and yeah cool mm. and we've got one already great so i'm gonna pop mm. greg on hello greg hello hey greg where hey, are you hello. calling from yeah good where are you calling from los angeles cool how's the show been for you so far uh good show i like the topic um i had a question because you guys were talking about the infinite and um i remember being a, i put i put the question in chat earlier but i remember being five years old and uh, i was i was really i started contemplating okay well if after you die you go to heaven right assuming you're going to heaven <laughs> and then, uh, even even the infinite nature of that as a five-year-old scared me right it was just um because because I was actually I didn't have the best childhood, so I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to be myself for infinity. This is gonna be miserable. Like I, there has to be some sort of end. There has to be <laughs> some sort of relaxation or something. So for a long time, that was a, a a massive point of suffering for me. And I think that if I could, I think that energy is still a part of me. If I really sit down and try to focus on it, it's still there. I, I just want to know what you guys thought about that and any thoughts, really. But you get wings and everything. <laughs> like like you, don't, you don't want wings or anything? And a, and a cute little halo hat thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, obviously I don't believe in that anymore, but I do. But reality is obviously infinite in nature, right? Mm -hmm. So there is truth to it, and you do have to make peace with that. And I just don't know if I have. Well, here's the thing. Um, great, great. Obviously... Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Amy. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm delayed. But what was the question? I missed it. I'm sorry. What was Greg's no, question? No, he's asking. He's asking about the the nature of 
at the existence after the fact do you remain the same well oh. greg my 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 answer to you is um reality looks a little bit different in the astral plane so let's say you go to heaven and you remain greg all right mm -hmm. and there you are just hanging around with the rest of the souls and greg is like just being greg imagine <laughs> that so monday you're greg friday you're greg right next month you're greg for the rest of eternity you are correct right here's another topic here's another concept people see um heaven as a kind of reintegration with the ultimate being right so mm -hmm. greg is no longer greg as you know it even greg that i'm speaking to right now is not greg greg the greg that i'm speaking to right now is a conscious version of yourself does that make sense okay let's not complicate it greg, <laughs> greg that i'm speaking to is conscious greg greg you are in beta consciousness you are your brain is operating at a certain level and you have to understand that the greg that i'm speaking to is just an interface that's all it is so you're thinking that well, I'm reasonably intelligent, David. I should be able to understand this. But the Greg that I'm speaking to is only 5 to 10% of your, of who you are. Okay? Right. right? Beneath that is another level of yourself, which is your memories and your emotions and your body's unconscious processes. That's a different Greg. Because the Greg that I'm speaking to, I, if I say 1 plus 1, you're going to tell me 2, Right? But if I tell your subconscious one plus one is going to tell me possibilities, flight, the orbs, everything else. <laughs> Beneath that level of Greg, there's another level of Greg, which we call a superconscious. That level of Greg is the same as David, is the same as Dale, is the same as Laura. This is why I tell people and I suggest, Greg, that you pick up meditation because you become very familiar with the fact that Greg is just an interface. It's just like, it's like Windows. It keeps crashing. Yeah. I, I, use, a, I use a Mac. I know, right. I know, what, you, I know what you're talking about. Um, I, I do meditate. I used to do it a lot more than I do now, but um, I, I think a part of what it is, is yes, you, you're, you're picking up on the right thing. It's like, it's the personality you got to let go of. And I, my assumption is if you let go of that egoic identity, then that pain is not attached. It's like you re you remove the resistance to like this infinite reality, right? I use I use that word again: surrender to the ultimate. Right. I like that. Ishwara Pranadana, one of the major um, niyamas that you have to learn. And I'll tell you why surrendering to the ultimate is important. Because when you let go of Greg, you know what happens next? Gregness happens. Gregness, and you have. Probably, and I've spoken to, uh, uh, I'm hearing in your voice that you would have already experienced something along the lines of Gregness. Because if you've meditated for any point in time, you would have experienced Gregness. You would have expanded, at least partially. Yeah. But it, hold on to that expansion for a long period of time so that, you know, Greg doesn't interfere. Because Greg is a real problem. You know what I mean, Greg? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have had a, an ego death when I took shrooms. Um, but the, you know, the problem is, it's like the problem with the ego death is it keeps going until it becomes a full surrender and a full awakening. So I'm still on that journey until I fully let go. But I think the, the problem I've always had is, is that part of my, like my soul is ready, but my ego is not ready to let go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Your ego so, is a problem. It is. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, <clears throat> so talking about death and seeing saying like an example of you greg of the now but then i'd speak to the greg who's crossed over in 100 years um there's so much difference and this is from my own personal experience of speaking to my dad um when i spoke to my dad in this lifetime he didn't want to talk he never really wanted to talk about anything he was a very shut off person didn't uh, love himself all of those different things led a lonely life to the day he died i actually then talked to him when he's crossed over now and he, it's beyond my recognition of how 
incredibly beautiful he is as bringing me ancestral wisdom like he's a different person like the so when i speak to my dad i'm like who the fuck is this guy like where, where i had a moment on the way uh two weeks ago um I, I was driving to harrogate and i had lots of stuff on like i was driving out two hours a day all of a sudden i, I got an, a feeling of this rainbow like love frequency come through me and the song when my dad died uh it's called sweet child of mine came on that came on at the exact same time when I felt him start pulsing this love through me. I started crying. And all of a sudden, he started saying, there's so much ancestral wisdom to be learned through all the experiences you're going through now. It's about seeing the ancestral wisdom for what it is. And I'm like, Dad, <laughs> like, that, like it's, that, there's so many different. So us all here now, compared to, like David said, that person you can be, there's just there's so much difference of correlation and experience. But when we cross over, we become the infinite soul, we, we're, we're only able to get parts of ourselves in the body. When we die, we're allowed to actually go into the, the, the main higher soul. Um, that's just from my own personal experience, from speaking to someone who's alive to someone who's dead. There's so many, di- there's so much difference. And there's such a big journey to go through as well, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, Greg, I suspect what you want to ask us is, how do I get a bypass to Greg, right? Well, yeah, well, I was just, yeah, I guess you could say, like, trying to figure out what's that roadblock to just surrendering, I guess. The roadblock to us surrendering is that, um, so, there are a lot of different spiritual paths that believe that the Greg, the Greg personality, is really the real Satan. And the reason, they, they believe it's Satan, and I'll explain to you why they believe it is. Because the, that word, Satan, means resistor that which resists okay Mm -hmm. it's going to to keep you um um engaged entangled um um pretty much it enforces its will upon what you are doing and so if you want to bypass greg what you might have to do you don't want to learn surrender but there's a few ways that you can you know learn surrender easily Okay, here's a bypass for you. Okay, it's a yoga exercise. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna give it to you, right? So, I don't want to get compl- uh, complicated, right? Go stand outside in the rain on one leg, okay? <coughs> on a tree, it's on a tree, right? Go stand out in the rain on one leg, just like the Bollywood movies, right? And stay there until you understand stuff. You see, the I would give you the shamanistic exercise, which is the, the traveler's exercise where you isolate yourself into the wild for a few days, right? But that's a bit extreme because, you know, I don't know where you live. You might be in New York. You, you're in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So, yeah, there's no isolating yourself anywhere, right? So... <laughs> what my my suggestion would be you learn to practice the tree that is a kind of surrender because it's uncomfortable that or zazen zazen is a kneeling exercise okay it's it feels stupid when you begin it feels really stupid you just kneel down you don't put your butt on your heels you just kneel down and you ask for the surrender try for five minutes see what happens we used to do an exercise in in um hatha yoga called a full scap prison. It's a piece of full scap paper that you stand on and you pretend like you're surrounded by walls of air until such time as you accept where you are. And the walls of air don't seem like a prison. You feel like you have a lot of space. That full scap prison expands. These are expansion exercises. You need to expand past Greg because Greg's function is to keep you in the here and now locked here and now right that's what the function of greg is the function of gregness is to keep you expanded right and the natural state your natural state is is one of expansion not one of what you're doing right now so somewhere along the line greg and i'm going to ask you some very surgical questions right now you ready for them all right somewhere along the line you prioritize the here and now as opposed to your expanded awareness, what the hell happened? Tell us. Uh, good question, because I wanted to go into that anyways. <laughs> so th- that's like the, you're asking for context, right? So I was actually, 
at one point in time, I was suffering immensely and I just decided to put my foot down and teach myself to meditate and heal. And I got to a point where I could meditate and heal for 24 hours a day. I was waking up in the middle of the night with epiphanies and I did that for a while until I, I, I realized there's, there's two points of suffering in my mind, which is two points of hurt. I healed mm -hmm. one of them, but I wasn't able to heal the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually got really good at psychic soul surgery. I got good at shifting my perspective to the non-physical. Mm -hmm. And what happened was I got to a point where my mind was fully in my body and I could feel my heart. Mm -hmm. And on the side of my heart, there was this crater. The crater is, is where the entity I have, this entity issue I have earlier on that it got in. And I, I only really, like, I guess you could say recently realized that it's the entity, or at least it's my best, best guess, but um it, it was there and then i was in a fully connected state my mind with my body i healed the resonant frequency that andrew talks about in his contract revocations all the time with that separates the mind from the heart i was there i was relaxed it took a lot of effort uh, uh, meditating while being attacked by the entity it was it was challenging but it was very rewarding and i actually think it's in hindsight one of the best parts of my life because it's pretty exciting despite the, the challenges um, and, but what happened after that is slowly, after a few days, um, I kind of healed everything that I could perceive. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So any, any problem that I had, I kind of healed that was at the layer I was consciously aware of. Yes. Or do you want me to keep <coughs> Can I, can I suggest something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to pretend that I'm, you're going to pretend that I'm the entity that's going to, uh, that's attacking you. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like to know how I get you to stop fighting? Oh, Would you like to, by making you believe everything is okay? Making me believe everything is okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. If I stop fighting, you stop fighting. Correct. Oh, I know what you mean. Cause that, cause there was a brief moment of time where the entity stopped fighting me. Well, Correct. yeah, that's because well, exactly. So it was for like a day the entity wasn't really able to, to penetrate me, my energy field because my mind was connected. And I kind of, I, I kind of got to a point where like, I was very ignorant. You know, I did a lot of what I did through psychic soul surgery, but I didn't understand anything. I still don't understand it. So I didn't know how to remove that crater in the heart. And I didn't know that I couldn't perceive the entity anymore. Um, I didn't know how to get rid of it. Um, and so what happened after a couple of days is my mind slowly started to, you know, the resonant frequency started to kick in, right? Slowly starting to just go back to normal because mm -hmm. what I did for three weeks of intensive, I guess you can call it Vipassana. I don't know what you want to call it, but mm -hmm. it's not sustainable in the long run. Even though I tried to sustain it, my ego slowly started to come back, right? And now my ego is at a point where I can't sit down and, and do psychic surgery on myself. It's very like... I guess you can say advanced at preventing me from doing it. So what I've learned is, and I have, I have to remove the doer or the meditator from the meditating. I know I understood everything you just said, yeah. and I'm just giving you a concept that when you are in these situations, this is a war, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Except when you're dealing with, let's say entities, they have read the art of war, several hundred times over okay yeah and so if you're dealing with an entity that is attached to your ego what is going to happen is that it's going to make you feel like everything is okay it's like you're in a dream and the dream says everything is okay but the ego creeps back in and asserts itself as a dominant force inside your, <coughs> your, your, your space. Mm -hmm. And in that space, that dominant force is going to reestablish itself and twine itself around everything that you utilized to dominate it in the first place, blocking off access to it, mm -hmm. right? The only thing that it can block off access to, I suggest that you change the technique that you're using and stop using Vipassana and all of those other techniques and use Shavasana, okay? The corpse, you have to die. Sorry, Greg, you got to die. You got to die, Greg, you got to die.
I know what you're talking about by dying, like like allowing your mind to go through the death process. Correct. You gotta die. Die. I mean, I, I so I went. I tried to go through that earlier on. So so let me backtrack. Uh -huh. um, everything I told you started more or less in 2019, but up until that point, uh -huh. um, after I had the ego death, which was in like 2012. Mm -hmm. For all that time, my Kundalini was on and the healing process was more or less automatic. I had like my heart was burning. I had visions like tremendous. Uh, I had high energy experiences. Um, and at some point in time that stopped and the, the, the journey started to transition as it, as it probably should. So the issue is, it's, it's like I, I'm kind of like at my point of awareness. You know, I've done everything that I could possibly do. Um, and actually, the more I healed, the more the entity got in. Is, yes, is, is this, go ahead, go ahead, Gil. Does it, so is this still happening with you? The entity? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's always there. So here's the thing. It's, it's actually very bad. If I sleep on my side and I focus my consciousness on my head, it starts attacking it. So I can only really sleep on my back. It's like literally inside my my cranium attacking me at all like i can't sleep properly if that makes sense my, um, my do you think do you think that you have made a sort of alliance with this entity to support some parts of yourself and reject other parts of yourself do you think that might be a problem because what you just described is the inability to sleep on your side uh for those of you who are in the chat who don't know what we're talking about we're talking about some very deep yoga concepts Mm -hmm. So sleeping on your right side um, will restrict your stomach, as an example. Sleeping on your left side um, opens it up. So, no, I mean, like, mechanically, it does that, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And so I think that what is happening is that you're, you have had that entity for a while. Mm -hmm. Let's call it an, an entity. Mm -hmm. You have an alliance with it, and it supports certain aspects of yourself. Of yourself and it's very hard to let go because you would like to let it go, but it also supports part of yourself. You have to figure out what the parts are. Cor what correct. Are so, so go ahead, Dale. So, so as I'm reading it, it's an ancestral entity. It's, it's connected to your ancestral lineage and it's going to require you, not someone to remove it for you. It's, but you're going to have to start bringing joy into your journey. Your journey doesn't have any joy and heart behind it. It's just got full, I'd say, too much seriousness, like you say, too much ego. You're going to have to start igniting that funness about yourself, that laughter, that joy, that experience. That's going to be something you're going to have to vitally put within you. And mm -hmm. the, there are ways you can actually innovate yourself out of this, allowing this ancestral being to stop fucking with you. And that, But it's up to you. You can get as many psychic surgeons to come in and remove it, but eventually this thing will come back. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're contracted this life to break it yourself. And this is something I come across a lot of people where it's separate from a demon, but it's an ancestral being who has a lot of fucking power over you, a lot yeah. of power. And it's how you can change that power around, start claiming sovereignty. sovereignty. And you like the hard task, don't you? This is going to be a hard task, but you're going to have to bring fun into it now. Laughter, laugh at its face. Um, and do you, do, you, do you have many times of laughter and joy in the experience of spirituality? Um, so, by the way, we have had a session before. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I can't remember. I, if you tell me more, <laughs> it'll come back. When, when about was it? I, I, I don't know, maybe six months ago or something, but... And you told yeah. me to make more beer and stuff. And, um, uh, and, and yes. yeah, yes, yes. So yeah. I, ha I have done that. I've done everything I have. There, so there was a specific point where I experienced joy um, during that intense healing experience in my heart. And it just kind of it, it attacked me and it attacked the joy directly. So it was just very unsustainable, um, especially at that point in time when, you know, I'm an ignorant first time healer. Right. I, I'm not psychically developed like you guys. I don't understand that stuff. For me, it's all just intuitive and willpower, to be honest. Sorry, did, did you just say that's, that? Psychically developed as as us. Obviously, if you're doing me. those level of uh, those level of things, you are psychically developed. <laughs> Let's not put no, ourselves well, down here. Well, here, okay. So here's my question: How do I bring, as you said, bring joy into it? Because I feel like I've tried everything. Um, 
right now, I'm mainly just focused on my job. That's all I'm really doing. Yes, David. Um, how do you bring joy into it? You think my life is joy? You want to know the joy I get? When I come on these shows and everybody's <laughs> playing green, that's joy. Okay. <laughs> so let me make a suggestion, and I'm going to put a plug in here for the UCM community. Join the UCM community where there's a whole bunch of people with the same kind of issues and stuff like that, where you can actually laugh, play one of my games. Bring joy into what you're doing. It's, but you, if you're doing it in an isolation and you're not used to it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay? Because so, I'm, sus I'm suspecting that the lesson that you have to learn, once again, is a kind of surrender. But the thing about it is that the entity that you are, fee you are, you are taking favors from that entity and the entity is taking favors from you. Right, right. So that, thank you for backtracking on that. I do have a part of myself that I guess you can say... Um, and I noticed it from a very young age, probably also five. It doesn't want me to have what I want. And I genuinely, I think I'm genuinely terrified of getting what I want. What's, um, what's your, what's your relationship? What was your relationship like with your mother as you grew up? Um, she, so I've forgiven her for a lot of stuff. Um, she did her best, but it, it, I mean, she was ignorant, like first four or five years arguing with my father and then they got a divorce, like always arguing. My mind separated um, from my heart when I was probably four, which is when I, I started remembering everything at the age of four. Um, okay, sorry, I was just looking at that chat. Uh, yeah. what, what, were you, what were you saying, Dale? Oh, I've lost hey. my train of focus. <laughs> you, you're, you're yes, mom. sorry about that, Greg. So your mum's like I'd say as I'm reading you, the there's the main things this being has power over you is mm -hmm. mother wounds, mother wounds. I think yeah. that's like the main thing you're gonna have to search into because that's the way it can really get into you because there's a huge I'd say hole in you at the moment. And as I'm speaking to your grandmothers, that's all they're showing me how the best way for you to resolve this of your own self is clearing those mother wounds, mother wounds and going into them those aspects of when you were young and so on, all of that shit is inner work. And as Andrew says, this is why the inner work journey is important. You have, we have to stop faking it and go back into each and every part of ourselves where there's back doors for these fuckers to get in. And we have to close them bit by bit and forgiveness. I, go ahead, David. Guys, I got to go. So I'm going to ask Greg a few, uh, just a couple of questions. Greg, what is it that you truly want? I, I mean, at the, at the top, I want enlightenment. I want like to fully surrender and I want to continue to just grow and contribute the most that I can to humanity. Okay. What is it that you want in life completely? What would make you the most happy? Um, I mean, I'm a swim coach, but I think um, if I could at some point in time be educating people, children in particular on a mass scale, because I'm really good at working with kids and teaching in general and I think that would be one of them. Obviously, having a family as well would be great. So Financial independence would be nice. <laughs> there, there are only two roads in front of you right now. Disentangling yourself from the entity, which will involve you to die, or incorporating and, re, um, incorporating and structural reintegrating that entity in such a way that it propels you towards what you want because that entity is like a horse that's riding you as opposed to you riding it. <laughs> yeah. Does that make any sense? So, yeah, no, it does. So if you are psychic enough for an entity to attack you, entities don't usually attack bricks. They don't, it's, 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 there's, no lot, there's not a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Um, so um, if you are psychic enough to be that, aware about that you have an external personality doing um doing stuff to you then my suggestion would be then my suggestion would be that you use that thing gain control right if you're going to have ego attached to it you're going to if you're going to have if it's if you're deriving benefit from that thing then use that thing or get rid of that thing you have two roads in front of you only two does that make sense yeah i'd rather get rid of it <laughs> really yeah well it's that possible i value my time and my rate of growth immensely it's cost me that and that's like the worst thing you could do to me in my opinion so i would want to excommunicate that ancestor from my lineage and 
just com completely remove it to the furthest ability that I can. Okay. Well, can you? I just can I just say Go something ahead. here that I think what you from everything you've said, Greg, what you need more than anything is sovereignty. You want your own sovereignty, and yeah. then none of this is an issue once you work towards getting your own sovereignty, because then you spoke about healing earlier. You want your healing to be authentic and worthwhile and not also feeding the entity for what it needs. So in order to do that, the main work from what I can see and everyone else has said here today is you've got to go work for your sovereignty and then the healing is really worthwhile. Then everything you're doing in life is totally aligned with the natural co-creative energies of Earth. It's mm -hmm. not aligned with something that's, that's hijacked you, whether it's been like helpful or not. At the end of the day, you're giving some of your power away to something that is not your authentic self. Yeah. And that will all, even if it propels you slightly in the beginning, long term, do you really want to sign away some of your power, your authentic power to something else? Sovereignty has got to be surely the, the springboard for everything that you want in this lifetime and your soul's future incarnations. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Um, so I, can, I guess I can, you reminded me of a, a part of my journey I left out telling you. Um, sovereignty means following your internal gui guidance to the best of your ability, correct? Um, a little bit, but it means a lot more than that. It means sovereign means being free, being yourself, not bound to anybody, not contracted to anybody. You're allowed to do what you want. Fr fr true freedom, basically, like you've denied negativity, you've denied ancestral karma. Um, sovereignty means a lot, doesn't it, Laura? If you want to add more to that. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty it means you're in charge of you. Yes. <laughs> Really? Yeah, that's what you're, I mean. You're, I mean you're, auth you're authentic self because if you're not sovereign of you, you can't be your authentic self because everything, other things are having this input and influence over you. So getting, as Andrew says so beautifully, getting to be the driver behind the wheel of your heart. And that's the other thing, not forgetting the mind-heart connection in all of this. And that's where you're driving your sovereignty from. It's There's no hierarchical order in this you i mean you are the the apex of your own hierarchical order nobody else's and that's yeah. where the sovereignty is it's not a, nothing to do with anybody else's journey at all and that's the beauty of it because yeah. you are driving your your own dna skin suit or flesh bag as i think they mm -hmm. described it earlier <laughs> Like, yeah, guys I, gotta, I, I, guys, I gotta jump off this broadcast because I gotta prepare for the webinar that's coming. Um, for those of you who are gonna be in the webinar, I will see you guys then. We're not going to talk about death in the webinar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no death. All right, so you guys, I'll see you guys later. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, David. Bye. Thanks, Thanks for coming on. on. Thank you. Hey. I you, think I remember, uh, I remember you, you mentioned that you said that. It's something about us being you're not on the level we are and that's your issue um by thinking that by putting people on pedestals by not actually owning your own power that you've got to be authentic and there's no hierarchy here me laura andrew we're all the same we're all on the same level and we got to see that um i so think that's a good point um i have had a i just realized the term like a week or two ago, I guess an addiction to authority. Maybe I kind of put myself down um, just for, mm -hmm. I don't know, the attention of the authority for answers I already have answers to. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I highly recommend yeah, Greg, that. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Sorry. Oh, oh no. All I was going to say to that right there is that that's a piece of inner work that you may need to work on. Like all these little pieces and facets of, of these little things we think aren't 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 big enough to work on. It's the little things, just like you said, that needs to be. You know why? Why do you do that? You know, with authority. I know I had to work on that. I put people on pedestals, yes. thinking they're better yeah. than me, instead of equal co-creation. 
Um, True sovereignty. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Why yeah. do you want to? Ma- why do you want to make yourself less? Yes. Right. Yes. Why do you want to make yourself less than the bright light that you are? And the entity is also making you less than the bright light that you are. Yeah. And something yeah. that came awesome. to me with the ent- that came to me with the entity is um, to trick it, trick it into don't don't play this dance with it anymore, like mm. trick it into thinking you know do something different with it, whatever that may be to you. But that yeah. was coming to me as you were talking. Um, yeah, and use um, as Laura and I like to do, use different voices bring out different voices that are inside you. Uh, that's way you, that you could trick it too, using a different voice when, you know, if you're speaking to it. Okay. Well, awesome. I don't know, that just yeah. came to me, yeah. Well yeah. said, great words, Amy. Uh, Greg, also Thanks. as well, I highly recommend to join the Psychic Surgery Workshop, um, the Psychic mm-hmm. Surgery Training I'm doing. Uh, if you're wanting to learn sovereignty and on your path towards that, the path to self mastery and learning the skills of of healing yourself basically that's something i highly recommend for you brother um yeah okay awesome thank you guys i appreciate it thank this you. was very helpful cheers brother thank great you, to greg. great to hear Bye. you guys, yeah Bye. thanks greg thanks for coming thank on thank you so we're going to get on now rolling earth so how many have we got left we've got two left to we'll go through these two brilliant yeah. hello Hi. Hi there. Where are you calling from? Uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Oh, cool. How are you finding the show so far? (laughs) Pretty good. I had a a recent experience with uh, the shaman's death, so I was kind of interested to see what other people's experience was. Mm. Okay. Everybody experiences shaman's death slightly differently, so describe your shaman's death. (laughs) Well, I apparently can't do it in a in a small amount. I uh, I went to Peru to do a medicine journey and uh, caught COVID. So I spent five days basically in a coma while I was at the shaman's property and had some really decent uh, journeying done during those five days. So. Um, and I'd been there previously and recited the shaman's death of Andrew's revocations. And, um, you know, just this whole thing came to fruition of uh, being able to have this so-called, you know, death, shaman's death. Very, very peaceful. Um, you know, the, the shaman kind of said, you know, way at the beginning and, you know, like, well, you need to write a will you know, because you can die from this. And it was, to me, it was not even relative to the situation. I mean, I just kind of ignored the comment <laughs> and uh, was really chipper all the way through it. I um, could feel the pressure difference when they opened the door up and they would try to get me to drink or or eat food, which I could do for or try for about 10 minutes before I'd fall asleep again. And um, then, of course, at the end of that, I ended up uh, having a tremendous journey. Like the, I've been barely got through the five days, and on the sixth day, we did the medicine journey again. And that was the freeing of the mind journey. So that was incredible. I mean, but it, there is that aspect of surrender. On my part, it wasn't a question. It wasn't anything that was going to interfere with it. Uh, you know, no one could say anything to minimize it or change it. It was just a very incredible uh, medicine journey. Beautiful. That beautifully put that. So, how many times did you do the medicine journey? Um, I've done. I started off with three ayahuascas, then did six San Pedro's, and had a kind of unique experience where I had to go back and do three ayahuascas again, just, uh, you know, like one of these uh, Akashic record moments where basically I woke up one morning and 
beam of light, opened it up, got my message that I was going back to Peru. So I did three more ayahuascas, of which two of them was, was with the black ayahuasca. And then finally I got to the, they did three more St. Pedro's to get to the final, if you want to call it the galactic joke journey. <laughs> and what did it teach you about death? Um, that's an interesting aspect to it. Um, I mean, obviously there wasn't a whole bunch of fear going in. So, um, my experience was more of how it manifested in terms of time. It just changed my reality of, you know, love time, apply that to any equation, any problem, any whatever and the thing will resolve itself it's just if i you know use the the concept of no time or having way too much of it <laughs> i think my expression at the end of the journey has got i've got all the time in the world now <laughs> i've like, got not enough time so yes much. i do <laughs> <laughs> got an infinite yeah. amount of time <laughs> infinite you know yes. it's like i've got so much and then then the love aspect to it and stuff just resolves now beautiful it's uh, it was i don't know it was you know going there though i mean i knew i was going there for that ceremony you know two or three months ahead of time so i did a lot of fasting up till then just to get myself into the right viewpoint you know mindset to just receive what it was that I was meant to receive. And there seems was... seem to be so much trust with your voice and how you're sharing mm -hmm. your journey with us. It just seems to be a huge layer of trust within yourself that you found yourself and you've gone through your own death process. And it's it's incredible to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I figured you. that would be of some interest to other people that are listening that uh, where it's kind of a little uh, abstract when you're talking about dying that way <laughs> it's beautiful how how long have you been listening to the show and andrew uh started with andrew 2015 and i've done 2015, the, uh, yeah sorry what was that sorry yeah go ahead 2015 you started listening yeah yeah and how has this material helped you I was being incredible. I mean, you, you, even if you have to go back and do it again, <laughs> you know, or, or take a rest, or yes, or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's it's like sometimes you can get overloaded by reading. You know, trying to figure out too much too quickly. Yes, beautiful. But let, well, letting it sink in and applying it is great. There we go. Um, yeah, thank you for calling in. We're at the end of the show now, but no, I appreciate you, you coming in and speaking your words of wisdom. It's inspiring, brother, and continue mm. on. Good way to finish. Yes. Thank you. On those good words. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. So, guys, what a fun show that was, Laura. It was. We've all got a webinar coming up, guys. The link's yes. in the chat there. It's the... Um, authorship webinar with david and andrew which is really worth attending um and it's straight on after this i think in about 10 minutes isn't it or they're yes. opening up the room soon yeah so so yeah thank you everyone thank you laura and all the the guests who have come on and um, also as well if you do want to join it's next week the 17th and 18th for the psychic surgery journey i'm also offering a free 30 minute session with the sign up of the sign up on to the psychic surgery itself um so yeah thank you so much and if you want to come on learn how to heal the soul learn to bring the soul back together piece by piece learn soul surgery it'll be an absolute honor to have you on brilliant i've done that course and it's uh, tremendous laura how can people Absolutely. get a hold of you for sessions if the yeah, if you'd like to come and sit around the ancestral fire with me, I'm an ancestral medium. 
So I'm at Laura2 with the number two, laura2feathers at gmail.com. Um, we have a web website, twofeathersmedicine.com. And also, oh, Dale, do we have oh, our yeah. link for our combined therapies? Uh, we should do somewhere. Yeah, we haven't so, put it up. Okay. So we, we basically, we've got the website up and running. There's been an issue with the URL, but... It is available on Facebook, on Laura's, on Andrew's page. If you go onto one of the Facebook groups, you can have a look at the link and the Combine Therapy link is there. We'll be in York in January for two weeks. Yeah. Andrew will be there as well, as well as David Ellis and Laura. Um, so, yeah, it'd be incredible to have you on, guys. Yeah, there's a couple of stops left. So, yes, that's where you can contact me. So thanks very much, guys, everybody who came in in the chat. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Sorry we didn't get around to uh, getting everybody on, but there we go. We'll always do another one. Yes. Beautiful. And if you want a psychic surgery with myself, visit daletobin.com. Good night and God bless. Yeah, good night. Aho. Aho.